All right, let's get this party started. Uh, welcome everybody to Classics 160 D2, Classical Mythology! And today's lecture 6.2 on Athena and the city of Athens. Today is going to be our kind of semi-deep dive uh, into archaeology, and in particular the architecture and art associated uh, with temples in the ancient Greek world. And in particular, we're going to focus on the art and architecture of the Athenian Acropolis, right, where the most famous temple, the Parthenon, in all of the Greek world uh, sits kind of overlooking all of Athens. So that's our plan for today. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start with a little brief recap on Athena and Poseidon, a few announcements, making sure you guys are ready to go for, uh, for the first draft of your research proposal on Friday. Uh, from there, we will dive into the contest for Athens. So we talked about Athena uh, on Monday. We talked about Poseidon on Monday. Now what we're going to do is see where they start to intersect, in particular uh, with the contest for Athens. Then we'll go into Athena's association with the city that's named after her, right? I, for some reason, it took me like years to figure this out, right? That like Athens is like the city of Athena. I don't know why it took me that long to figure it out. It makes total sense. <laughs> but it wasn't obvious to me for some reason. But yes, this whole city is named after the goddess Athena because of the contest for Athens. Um, then we will get into the Parthenon itself, and in particular, one of the major rituals and festivals associated with Athena and the city of Athens, and that's known as the Panathenaea. And we'll see how uh, the art kind of on the Parthenon gives us a sense for what the Panathenaea was actually like. And then we'll close uh, by telling the story of the foundation of Athens, right? So these are kind of related, the contest for Athens and the foundation of, uh, for Athens. Um, the founding actually comes first, but for whatever reason, that's going to come last today. So announcements and recap. Your announcements are all the same. Go ahead and put this thing into speaker view. You can see me. You can see the notes. You can see everything. You'll see all the pretty pictures of the Parthenon. Uh, if you have a question, go ahead and shoot it to your TA and they'll get back to you or they'll forward that question uh, to me. And then uh, most importantly, of course, your research proposal drafts are due this Friday, right? So try to do a good job on those. They're not a huge part of your grade. I think it's something like 5% maybe. So really the idea is, is think creatively here, right? Don't worry about uh, having things absolutely perfect. It's a draft, but be creative, be thoughtful, put some work into trying to think of how this idea will actually work and what the sources are that you might use for it um, and get that in uh, by Friday. Again, if you have any questions on it at all, go ahead and get in touch with your, uh, your TA by the end of today at the latest, the earlier the better on that sort of thing so that they can give you a good response. All right, so what did we do on Monday? We talked about Athena and we started with the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus, right? So remember what ends up happening is in the days long before Hera, Zeus was married to this Titanus, Metis, who was like the wisest of all the Greek deities. But he had this prophecy that his child was going to overthrow him, bad things were going to happen. So he pulls a Cronus and he actually eats his wife, right? Instead of his, ch instead of his child, he eats his wife. Uh, but somehow, like, the baby starts growing inside of him in his belly, inside of his wife's belly, which is in his belly, something like that. And then all of a sudden he gets this terrible headache. Hephaestus comes in with his double-bladed Minoan axe, chops him in the head, and out pops Athena, right? Fully formed, ready for battle. You can see her here on this ancient Greek vase with the spear, with the shield. She is ready to go. Now, we also talked about all the different things that Athena is associated with, right? And crafts and craftsmanship are, are is one of those kind of major uh, things, right? So we saw her um, association with shipbuilders. We saw her association uh, with the plow, right? She's the one who invented the plow. We saw uh, her association with the chariot, inventing the bridle for the chariot. And then in some depth, we saw her association with uh, the art of weaving, right? And we saw that in particular with the story of Arachne. And Arachne is this uh, just incredible weaver from northern Greece, from the little town of Lydia. But she also gets way too big for her britches, right? So she starts bragging about how good she is at this. 
about how she taught herself all these skills, about how she's better than Athena herself. And good old Athena comes down and tries to give her the benefit of the doubt, right? And says, hey, look, you are pretty good. Maybe you should not disrespect the gods. She just keeps disrespecting the gods. And in, in the end, they have this big contest, right, between Arachne and Athena. And it turns out to be a tie, right? Like, Arachne really is that good. But even in her kind of like quasi-victory there, right, she still badmouths the gods. And what ends up happening then, right? Athena ends up turning her in to the world's first spider, right? She's shrinking and getting hairy and growing legs and eyeballs. And what's happened is that she's kept her skill, right? She weaves these beautiful, beautiful, unique spider webs, but she's lost her humanity. So again, kind of a story to both respect the gods and a story to uh, solidify Athena's association with uh, weaving and textiles. <clears throat> okay, we also saw Athena's connection with war, right? And we've seen this before with Ares, but with Athena, it's a very, very different sort of deal, right? Athena is the goddess of, of kind of all the great qualities of warfare. I know that might not sound good to everybody, but like there are certainly uh, positive qualities that come out of war, strategy and um, uh, teamwork, right? Uh, bravery, courage, all these things are associated with Athena. And we see her help people like Achilles in the Trojan War. Uh, people like Heracles with his 12 labors. She's very frequently helping out these kind of famous Greek heroes so that they can accomplish their tasks in an intelligent way, right? And we saw that in particular with like one of Heracles' labors where he needs to uh, clean the Algean stables and to do so, Athena gives him the idea of diverting one of the local rivers to flow through the stables and clear everything out kind of the, the world's first example of uh, using, uh, you know, clean energy, using water power to accomplish a task. All right, and then uh, in the second half of yesterday, we talk, uh, Monday, we talked about Poseidon, right? And we saw uh, Poseidon's association, of course, with the sea, right? He doesn't spend that much time on Olympus. He's much more associated with the sea itself. Um, and whereas Athena is seen as kind of this goddess of the city, right? A civilized urban goddess. Poseidon is the opposite, right? He's like a chaotic nature god. And we see his association with horses, right? Often known as Poseidon or, or Hippias, right? Of horses. Um, he ends up being the father of the winged horse Pegasus uh, with, the, god, uh, with the, the monster Medusa. And we also see his association not only with the sea, not only with horses, but also, also with earthquakes, right? And we get his, his kind of epithet, Anos Gaius, the earth shaker. And those earthquakes result when he smashes the ground with his trident. All right, so let's take a look at where Athena and Poseidon kind of come together here, right? And this happens in the very early days of Athens, all right? And in the early days of Athens, we go back to the very, very, very um, first ruler of the city, this guy named Kekrops. And we can see a depiction of him over here. Now, Kekrops was a pretty weird dude, all right? So he's like half man and half like either fish or serpent or something along those lines. He's kind of like a centaur, but half man, half snake. I don't like a, a, a serpent dude. I don't know what the centaur name for a half person, half snake is. Um, but he is one of the early gods. And the reason he is like this is because he basically arose from the ground, right? So the first uh, ruler of Athens um, comes straight from the ground, half ruler, half snake. And he has this brilliant idea. I really like this idea. He's like, all right, we got a sweet new city. I'm the ruler of the city. We need like a patron god or goddess. And what he's going to do in order to figure out which of the Olympian gods uh, will become the patron of the city, he's going to hold a contest, right? And the contest is essentially um, to see which god can give the best gift to the city, right? So there's two applicants. And uh, what we end up with um, is uh, we end up with Athena, we end up with Poseidon, and again, the, the contest 
is to see which one of them can give the best gift to the city. And I, I just like this because it's like, I feel like it's something I should do. Like, oh, the contest for the best grade is to see who can give the best gift to the professor. <laughs> no, you can't actually do that, but it sounds like a good idea. Uh, also, somebody in the chat said, a half person, half snake is called a lamia or a lamia. So there you go, a lamia. That's what we call kekrops. Now, uh, Poseidon is the first person to give his gift to the city of Athens, right? And he gives water, which sounds like a great gift, right? So in order to do so, right, as God of the sea, he smashes his trident into the ground onto the Acropolis in Athens. The Acropolis will see the high point of the city. Uh, but of course, Poseidon is not the god of like rain and he's not the god of like lakes and he's not the god of freshwater rivers. He is the god of the sea. And so the water that spurts out of the Acropolis is of course salt water. And I don't know why he didn't think of this. It seems like kind of obvious that it would be salt water. Salt water is not particularly useful. You can't drink it. You can't like plant things with it. Kind of, I guess you can make salt out of it and salt's pretty delicious, but that's about it. So anyway, he strikes the ground, out comes water. It turns out to be salt water. Now, very interestingly, on the Acropolis, uh, the kind of, we have a temple on the site where this legendary kind of like trident strike happened, all right? Um, and uh, this is known as the Erechtheion, uh, the kind of super weird looking temple in the middle of the Acropolis, all right? And you can notice, again, this is the, uh, the weird one. It's got what are known as caryatids. We'll see them later in the lecture. Those are those like uh, columns that are carved into the shape of women. And then instead of a, a normal kind of temple uh, plan, it's got, it looks like it's been built kind of like piecemeal. But this is where, uh, again, Poseidon was said to have struck the trident and water gushes out, um, but it's salt water. This is also, where Athena gives her gift to the city. And you can see that down in the left-hand corner right here. And that, of course, is the olive tree. Now, the olive tree is super important for a lot of reasons. When you think of the ancient Greek world, all right, olives are good for like almost everything, right? So you can eat olives. You can make olive oil out of olives. Olives, Olive oil is good for like actual food type things. It's what you use as fuel, right? So if you want light after dark, right? You use little like lamps and those lamps are fueled by olive oil. Um, it's what you use uh, in large part for different hygiene type things. So if you take a class on like Greek culture, one of the things they do is you go down to the gymnasium, right? And you like get naked and you wrestle a bunch of dudes. Uh, but before you do that, you like get all greased up with olive oil. Um, and then I guess you get greased up afterwards with olive oil as well. So you're using olive oil for all sorts of things. And the idea here is that the Athenians will never starve because on the Acropolis, the most easily defended part of the city, there is an olive tree that can provide them with food. And to this day, right, this is said to be the tree, right, the gift of Athena herself. Uh, and it is the only tree that exists on the Acropolis. Okay, now. Uh, so they've given their gifts. It seems like there should be an obvious winner. Um, but there's not, the gods have to vote on like, uh, like who wins this thing. There are different versions of how that turns out. Or, you know, all the versions have Athena winning. There are different versions. Some say it was like unanimously Athena won. Others are like, um, it was like a tie. Uh, uh, it would have been a tie, but like kind of the girls vote for uh, Athena. The guys vote for Poseidon. There were more girls than guys, so they win. Um, and some of the versions as retribution for, uh, for this kind of vote where a woman got to be like, or a female goddess got to be the patron God. They like take away the voting rights for women in actual Athens. <laughs> I think that it's really like a raw deal, you know, that they're like, no, you can't vote women because Athena's the goddess of the city. Doesn't even make any sense. Anyway. Uh, Athena has won the contest for the city of Athens, and thus she becomes the patron god of the city. Yeah, one of the other interesting kind of um, things here, right? Uh, for whatever reason, a lot of the cities in the ancient world, um, ancient and modern world, you get like plural names, right? So like uh, Athens, right, is like kind of the plural of Athena. 
Uh, in ancient Greek, it would have been Athenai um, or Athene. And uh, yeah, plural version. You get that in Cincinnati too, like Cincinnati, Ohio. It's like the plural of the, the ancient Roman dude, Cincinnatus. So for whatever reason, they like to make cities plural in nature. Um, what was Athens named before she was the goddess? Uh, I don't think, like, Kekrops was the first dude, so I think he just founded a city, and he, like, probably called it, like, Kekropia or something like that, and then they got Athena, and they're like, ah, oh, Athens sounds way better than Kekropia, something along those lines. So let's take a look at Athena and the city of Athens. Um, so we saw, right, with Poseidon, that he's, like, Poseidon the Earth Shaker, Poseidon of the Horses. Um, Athena, we get a couple different versions of her as well. So we get Athena Polius, right? Athena, the protector of the city, right? So she's like the protector of the city of Athens. We get Athena Parthenos, Athena the virgin, or Athena the maiden, right? So we'll get to this a little bit later on, but this is why we call the temple, the maid, the huge temple on the Acropolis in Athens, the Parthenon, right? Is because it's named after this version of Athena, right? Um, then we also have uh, Athena Nike, or Athena Nike, right? Athena, the goddess of victory. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, a Nike, Nike means victory. Um, and so when you see like Nike shoes, right? Like this is very much uh, named after um, the, the Greek word for victory, the goddess Athena Nike. And when you see kind of what depictions of the goddess Athena Nike look like, uh, you'll see why you get the, uh, the swoosh. And then you have uh, her kind of war version, right? Athena Promachos, uh, which very literally means, right? Athena in front of the battle, right? Like, so Makos is like, uh, like a battle um, pro in front of, this is like Athena who like leads you in to battle. So all four of these different versions of Athena portrayed in different ways. Um, and we'll see how some of those different portrayals look as we move on with today's lecture. Okay, so let's start by, uh, by getting kind of a sense for what the city of Athens looks like. Maybe I can get my, my big head out of the way here. Let's see, does that work? Kind of, sort of. Okay, good. So we, we can see the walls of the ancient city here, right? And then this thing right here, this is the rocky outcropping known as the Acropolis. In ancient Greek cities, uh, tend to, a lot of them tend to have something along these lines where you kind of have three different parts to each city-state. You have the Acropolis, the kind of high religious point of the city. You have the Asti. Um, you don't need to remember the, uh, the, the name for that and the, the farmland. Um, for a different class, you will. You have the Asti, which is like the rest of the city inside the city walls here. Uh, that's kind of like the lower city. Um, and then you have the, the Cora, or the, uh, uh, the farmland surrounding it. And all three of those parts kind of make up the, uh, the city-state. So if you look at Athens, you've got the Acropolis, uh, where the religious center is. Um, you've got the Theater of Dionysus down here, right? That's where plays would have been put on. Um, you have the Agora, that's the original marketplace. The Areopagus, this is where the first trial in Athens is. Um, and so it becomes kind of a judicial center for the city. Um, and then there would have been different neighborhoods as well. So like what we now know as the, uh, the cemetery, the Karamikos, was actually, um, for, for some of Greek antiquity, the ceramics quarter, right? The, the potter's quarter of the, uh, the ancient city. So let's go ahead and zoom in on the Acropolis itself. So this gives us kind of a different look. Um, maybe not the most beautiful drawing, but it gives you a good sense for like kind of how to look at this from a skewed like 3D kind of look, right? Um, and uh, we can see the Agora down below, right? Where the, the marketplace would have been, where people would have been trading. Later on, it becomes a, a political center in the city. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, the other, oh, hang on. Just got one message here. Yeah, Colin, I, I can make you a host right now. Hang on one second. Boom, boom. All right, there you go, Colin. Good to go. Um, okay, uh, so there we go. Okay, so we've got the Acropolis up here. Um, one of the amazing things about the Acropolis, if and when you guys go to Greece, it like really does stick out. 
So ancient Rome was the city of seven hills. And if you ever go to Rome, like it kind of feels like there are still hills today. It's kind of hard to see them. It's so built up, it's tough to get a sense for like what it would have looked like in antiquity. Um, when you go to Athens, like the Acropolis is jutting out uh, absolutely from the city. You can still see like the rocky walls on which the, uh, the, the religious structures were built. And then down below you have the Agora, again, originally an economic center, later a political center. We saw when we were talking about uh, Hephaestus last week, right? The temple of Hephaestus. So that's overlooking the Agora, right? And it makes sense because he's kind of the god of the forge, the god of craftsmen. Um, and so he's overlooking people selling their crafts. And we'll come back to this later and see how one of the major rituals, that Panathenaea, winds its way through all of these things and then up onto the Acropolis. Okay, and then here what we're looking at is a plan of the Acropolis itself, okay? And you can see the kind of different structures that uh, when we're looking at classical Athens, when you go to Athens and you see the stuff on the Acropolis, like most of what you're looking at is in the dark green here, all right? So kind of picture the dark green as the stuff that's still there. Then what you wanna look at is like prior to that time, there were, there were other structures on there. Like before the Parthenon got built, there were a bunch of other like little temples and altars uh, and structures on top of the Acropolis, but it all got destroyed. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And then here what we're looking at uh, is a picture. Let me go ahead and change that. Hang on, hang on. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Okay, yeah, so here we're looking at the Acropolis itself. You can see how much it actually does jut out from the city. Um, and the major structures that we're looking at today, uh, we're going to look at this, which is kind of the front gate to the city. We're going to look at this tiny little temple here, the Temple of Athena Nike. Um, we're going to look at the Parthenon itself. That's the huge one, right? And then this is the Erechtheon that we were looking at earlier. Um, where we got the, uh, the site of the, uh, the contest between Poseidon and Athena. Now, the story of the Acropolis, like I was saying, um, it's not just one time in Greek history where this is built up and you end up with like uh, the, the Parthenon, right? The structures on the Acropolis end up going back at least a century long before um, uh, the, the Parthenon itself. And it actually probably goes back another thousand years before that. We have some Bronze Age Mycenaean uh, uh, artifacts and, and remnants of a couple little structures on there as well. Now, uh, one of the things that we actually have, which is kind of amazing, uh, is this, this base of an old, old, old olive tree uh, that ends up being uh, what scholars think was the cult statue of the earliest version of Athena worshipped on the Acropolis. So Athena Polius, Athena protector of the city, was the version of Athena worshipped on the Acropolis prior um, to, uh, to the Parthenon, okay? And we still have this cult statue. It's a log of an olive tree. It's thought to have been sent from Olympus. Uh, and then it was kind of taken down when the, the Acropolis was burned by the Persians. So in 480 BC, the Acropolis in Athens ends up getting burned by the Persians. Now, most of you guys have probably seen um, the, uh, the, the movie 300, or some of you have seen that. We'll talk about it in just a second. Um, it's this heroic Greek defense, right, of the, uh, the hot gates of Thermopylae. But the Greeks lose, right? And what ends up happening after that is the Persians go through and they burn the city of Athens. Now, to get back to this kind of cult statue, right, of Athena here, um, it gets back to how these early archaic cult statues of god, uh, gods and goddesses were frequently like natural things. So we have the olive log here representing Athena. We remember when we talked about Aphrodite, right? This is kind of what we expect, right? Like a Venus de Milo sort of thing. And frequently what we get is something um, very natural, right? This basalt boulder that was the cult statue of Aphrodite. So again, um, when we think of uh, the kind of history of ancient Greece, um, 
Athens gets burned in 480, right? So we get this big war. If you want to learn more about it, take one of my history courses, like Meet the Ancients or something like that. We'll talk a lot uh, about the battle between the Greeks and the Persians. Um, but Persia's coming in with like the biggest army the world's ever seen. And the Greeks put up their defense at Thermopylae, right? So movie 300 based on that. Heroic defense of the hot gates. It lasts way longer than anybody could have expected. But the Greeks lose, right? The Spartans do die in the end, and the Persians continue marching. And the Athenians have to decide what to do. Like, do they make another defense? Do they defend the city? And what ends up happening is they actually retreat to the city of Corinth and basically abandon the city of Athens. And so in 480, the Persians come through, they burn the city, and they burn those structures on the Acropolis uh, that were there at the time. Now, this kind of sort of ends up being a blessing in disguise because it means that when the Greeks actually do beat the Persians, I guess that's kind of a spoiler alert, in the end, the Greeks win. Um, when they do beat the Persians, they have this blank slate on the Acropolis, right? Because it all got burned, there's nothing on there and they get to rebuild the entire thing. And so all those buildings, the, Acro uh, the Parthenon and the Temple of Athena and Nike and the Propylaea, uh, and the uh, Eric Theon, these all date to that century after um, the Greeks defeat the Persians. Now, one of the amazing things here is simply how quickly this gets done. So the, uh, the Parthenon is started in 447 BC, right? So 447. The structure itself is done within nine years. So by 438, the building itself is done, and then all the artistic work on it takes another six. So in 15 years, 447 to 432, the whole Acropolis is finished. Now, what's amazing is that in the modern period, like we've been working to, you know, people have been working to, to renovate and restore the, uh, the Parthenon. That's been going on for like 100 years, right? So in antiquity, they built it from scratch uh, in 15 years. In the modern world, we've been working to restore it for 100 years, and it still looks like this. Still not even close to being done. Now, what we're going to do here is go through the, uh, the four major structures on the Acropolis. And we're going to start with where you would have entered. Okay, so the entrance gate is known as the Propylaea, which very literally translates as like the front gate. Right, so Pylaea, right, pylon meaning gate. Uh, pro meaning in front, very literally, the front gate. And it's this monumental entrance way. And we'll see when we get to the Panathenaic Festival, this is where people would have gone to enter like the, uh, the, the kind of area itself on the Acropolis. And you can look and see where that is placed right now, right? So right at the uh, entrance way, you would have wound your way up here, up the stairs, and then entered through the, the front gate. And the next thing we're gonna look at is Something else you pass on your way up that kind of juts out from this kind of front corner of the, uh, the Acropolis. And that's known as the Temple of Athena Nike, right? So multiple temples to Athena, but different versions of Athena, right? And so this is the Temple of Athena Nike. You can see it's, it's perched on the very, very, very edge uh, of the Acropolis, you can get a good sense here for just how much you can see from the Acropolis, right? So you can see uh, some of the city down below. Um, you can see very, very lightly uh, some of the, uh, the Aegean Sea, right? Um, uh, in the, the background there. So we got this tiny little temple to Athena Nike. We'll see it's Ionic in style, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what that uh, means later on. Um, somebody was asking, was Nike inspired by Athena Nike? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Um, that, like, the shoes Nike, right, the brand Nike is inspired by Athena, and not just any Athena, Athena Nike, the goddess of victory. And what we can see, right, is the way that uh, Athena Nike was, uh, was portrayed in antiquity was with, like, the wings, right, the winged victory. This is like a, a copy of the uh, winged Nike of Samothrace, um, and it's a, one of the very, very famous uh, depictions of this kind of flowing dress, right, and the, the wings of victory in the, the Louvre today. So if you go to, uh, to visit Paris, make sure to check out the Louvre and check out the winged Nike of Samothrace. Okay, 
Now let's go ahead and talk about the most famous, right, of the, uh, the buildings, uh, the Parthenon itself, and then the associated festival with the Athena statue in the Parthenon, the, uh, the, Pan-Athenaic, uh, the Panathenaic Festival. Okay, so right now we've made our way up onto the, the Acropolis. We've passed through the Propylaea. On our way in there, we passed by the little temple of Athena Nike. You can see how small it is in scale there. And now we're going around to the front of the Parthenon here. All right, so we kind of got to walk by it and then enter it this way. And the Parthenon is by far uh, the biggest temple on the Acropolis. So when we look at the Parthenon, we're looking at something like this. Um, and again, when we say the word Parthenon, what we mean is the temple of Athena Parthenos. Okay, so temple to Athena. And which version of Athena? The maiden, right? The Parthenos, uh, the virgin or the maiden. And again, this is kind of one of the most uh, iconographic architect, probably the most iconographic architectural um, feature in all of the ancient Greek world. And when we look at it today, right, it's like the most famous today. It was also the most famous in antiquity, right? Like people, people knew this was something to be marveled at. Now, let's go ahead and what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about Greek temples themselves um, and kind of how uh, they're laid out. Right, so the basic layout of a Greek temple. We're going to start with the plan of the Parthenon itself. And what you can see, right, it's surrounded by columns here. All right, this is known as like the peristyle. Um, it's got like a little front entry porch here. All right, we'll see what that is in a second. It's got the sanctuary itself. And this is where the, uh, the statue would have stood. And then it's got this little thing on the back, right, this little butt to the temple. Uh, and this is known as like the treasury. Um, and what this is for is basically when people come to visit the temple or something along those lines, right, they will frequently leave a gift for the god or the goddess, right? And this does two things. One, it like shows that you honor the god or goddess. And two, it can often kind of like stand in and intercede for you while you're not there. Um, so you can leave like a little like votive statue. And that means even when you leave, it'll kind of like intercede with the goddess for you. Um, once you're, you're out of there. Now, this kind of maps on to a, uh, so this is the actual Parthenon right here. And then this is a, uh, a generic um, plan of what a Greek temple looks like, right? So, so these are some of the major features. What we're looking at is the peristyle, right? All these little round things. Those are the columns that we associate with Greek temples, okay? Uh, it all stands on a platform known as a stylobate, okay? So they level something out, right? They have a stone platform on which everything stands. That's known as the stylobate. All the, the, the columns of the peristyle stand on top of that. And then you have the, uh, the sanctuary itself. You have the, the pronous. So nous is the Greek word for sanctuary. And so this is the little kind of like vestibule, the little entryway before you get into the main sanctuary. You get the main sanctuary itself. In Latin, this is known as a cella. In Greek, a naos or naos. And then in the back, right, the butt of the temple, that's the epistodomos. And this is the treasury. This is where all the things uh, would have been kept for the, uh, the, the god or the goddess, right, the, the different gifts. Now, somebody had a good question in the, uh, the chat. What happens to these things? Like, doesn't it get filled up? Um, and a couple different things happen to them. So sometimes what they'll do is they'll take the little gifts and they'll just like make a new floor in the, uh, the temple. So there was a site I worked at on the island of Cyprus, a, a Greek sanctuary there. And what would happen is as you dug down, you'd hit these floor levels where it was like completely like basically broken statues that would have been left by visitors that they used to basically level out the floor. So you dig through all this like crap or whatever, and then you'd hit like statue city, right? And you're just pulling out like heads and arms and stuff like that. It was super cool. Um, the other thing that ends up happening is that if they were metal gifts, sometimes they'll actually get melted down. So again, if you take the history class, you'll see that in the, uh, the Peloponnesian War, the big war between Athens and Sparta, Athens is getting beat so badly at one point that they actually take all the stuff from the treasury and the cult statue itself and they melt it down, right? They like melt down the goddess herself. 
to get the like precious metal from that. And then they use that to, uh, to build a fleet to put up a fight against Sparta. Um, so a couple things that happen with those. Okay, uh, one of the kind of cool things is that with um, the, uh, the, the construction of this, there are these small little optical illusions that are built into the temple to kind of make it look right. So one is you get like a, a curvature of the platform, right? So it's like very, very slightly curved. If you measure it in the middle, it's a couple inches higher than if you measure it on the sides. That allows rainwater to, to uh, kind of filter off. Um, it also makes it look flat from a distance because otherwise from a distance it would look kind of concave. Um, you also get uh, the tapering of the sanctuary. So it kind of like goes closer as you get farther back and it makes it look longer when you go into it. And then you get the columns themselves and the columns themselves, you'd think of them, they look straight, right? They actually bulge in the middle a little bit. And again, this is this kind of optical illusion. When you look at it from far back, it looks totally straight, but that's because of the bulge. If it actually was straight, it would look kind of like wonky and it would look like it has like a cinched waist. Um, so a couple of these things that the, uh, the designer of the, the Parthenon um, took into the, took into account how one actually would view this. Uh, and there are basically almost no straight, like perfectly straight lines anywhere. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look a little bit um, at the, uh, the different kind of um, art and architecture of the, uh, the Parthenon itself. So when we do that, there are a couple terms we wanna know. So the first thing is the, the pediment, okay? And the pediment is the triangular thing. All right, so when you look at a Greek temple, you got the columns, right? And then on the front and the back, there's like a triangle and there's frequently like decoration on that, all right? And that triangle is known as the pediment and the, the kind of art on there are known as pedimental sculptures. And we'll come back and talk about these things in a little bit. So here, you can see on the Parthenon itself, right? That there's this triangular thing on top of it. That's the pediment. And you can see that there's just a little bit of sculpture that's left on there, all right? So the rest of it has been taken away, chiseled off, fallen off. It almost all ends up in England, right? So Britain takes all of this stuff. Um, this is an interesting kind of uh, debate about where these things should be. So what ends up happening is when Greece was under control of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire basically sold a lot of this stuff to Britain. And now the debate is like, well, should Britain give these things back to Greece? And Britain says like, well, we purchased those from the rulers of that area at the time. We don't have to give it back. And Greece is like, come on, it's our stuff. Like, um, so there's still a debate about all that, but this would have all been decorated in antiquity. And we can see if you go to like the, the British Museum in, uh, in London, you can see some of these things. And these are really like uh, the pinnacle of like classical sculpture. And you can see just how much movement you get, right? Just how much flowing movement you get out of the figures uh, on, the, um, on the sculptures that would have been on the, uh, the, the, the pediments, known as the, the Parthenon marbles here, right? So you can also see how uh, these, this guy would have like fit into the corner and eventually you'd get this kind of like nice, like triangular shape to the, the sculptures. Now, what was on those, right? Um, so there, we, we know, even if we don't have all the sculptures left, we know what was on there from people who like in antiquity went around and wrote down like, oh, if you go to the Parthenon and you look at the west side of it, you can see this scene. And on the west side, what you end up seeing is what we just talked about earlier today, right? The contest between Athena and Poseidon, right? So this is an artist's recreation. Again, we have some of these sculptures, so we know what they look like. We don't have all of them, so a lot of this is kind of interpretive, but we see Poseidon with his trident. We see Athena uh, with, um, with her olive tree here. On the other side of this, uh, we end up with the birth of Athena. So on the east side, again, we saw that myth on, uh, on Monday. Uh, again, Athena kind of coming out of the head of Zeus. And so here we see Hephaestus, right, with his double ax. Athena has just recently emerged. She's in her like battle form, right, with the, uh, with the shield here and the spear. Um, and then we've got Zeus himself. So when you looked at the triangular areas in antiquity, 
On one side, you end up with the contest for Athens between Athena and Poseidon. On the other side, you end up with the myth of the birth of Athena. All right, so now what we're going to go through is we're going to talk about the, uh, the metopes, okay? And the metopes are this in pink right here, right? These would have been sculptures that are seen um, as you kind of move around the outside of the temple. And it comes from like, we got these two words, we got triglyphs. Triglyphs are these things with, uh, with kind of up and down there. Um, yeah, you get three like lines coming up and down. What scholars think these are is kind of like a stone version of like a wooden temple. So before we had stone temples, Greeks built temples out of wood and they would have had these wood beams. And so, uh, so some scholars think that what we're getting with these, these three lines is basically, they kept the look of it even though they're making it in stone now and you don't really need it architecturally. And then these areas in between, these metopes, all right, um, would have been uh, decorated frequently. Okay, so triglyphs, the things with the three lines, metopes, the blank areas that would have been decorated. And what we end up seeing um, is uh, we see a series of different things on those metopes, okay? So on the, uh, the, the east side of the Parthenon, we get what's known as the gigantomachy, 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 right? The battle uh, between the Olympians and the giants. So this isn't the same as the Olympians and the Titans, but it's another big battle. Uh, one of the things that happens in this battle is that it's like prophesized that the gods themselves can't beat the giants and they need a mortal to help. Uh, and so the mortal that they get to help, of course, is our, uh, our main man, Heracles. So Heracles comes up and uh, defeats the giant. So let's go ahead and take two minutes here um, and uh, go ahead and put input your attendance for today. Uh, the color is poipul, all right? So go ahead, go to attendance. Um, I don't know if I have a link on there. I put it under today, but just go to quizzes, select attendance 13, September 30th, and select poipul. And at 11.45, I'll pick back up. All right, let's get back to it. So again, if you haven't done so, get on to the, the D2L and the quizzes and select Poiple, and let's go ahead and go check out the other sides of the temple and their metopes. Um, okay, so if we look at the south side, we see the Centauromachy, and this is the battle between the Lapiths and the Centaurs, the Greeks and the Centaurs. Um, it all goes down at a wedding. So there's this wedding of this guy, Pyrrhus. We'll see him later uh, in the course. Um, where he teams up like Theseus to go like steal some women. Uh, but prior to this, he's having a wedding. He invents, he invites the centaurs. The centaurs had never had wine before, so they drink a bunch of wine and then they get like real drunk and then they start trying to steal all the women. Um, and then there's this big battle. So it's the, the Lapiths, um, which is a certain version of the Greeks fighting the centaurs. On the west side, we get the Amazonomachy. Um, which is the battle between the Greeks and the Amazons. And then on the north side, we get the, the Trojan War. Okay, so what we see here, right, is we see, uh, we see the Gigantomachy, 
right? So Greeks versus giants, Greeks versus centaurs, Greeks versus uh, Amazons, Greeks versus Trojans. And so what you'll see here, right, is that all of these things, in addition to kind of reminding you of different myths uh, associated with the Greeks, are all about the Greeks battling and winning against different kind of barbarian groups, right? And so the idea here is that what the Metopes or the sculptures on the Metopes are suggesting is the Greeks' ability to kind of um, have civilization conquer kind of uh, barbarism, right? It's the Greek ability to impose civilization on the world and kind of subdue chaos. All right. And then uh, finally, what we end up looking at today uh, is the frieze. OK, so on the outside, what we get is the pediment. That's the triangular thing. Then what we're looking at are the metopes, the triglyphs and metopes, the three lines interspersed with sculptures. And that's where you get the Greek battles against these different groups. And then on the inside, right, the second set of, uh, of kind of columns, all along the inside, you have a continuous sculptural thing, right? Not broken up at all. It's the whole thing's continuous, goes all the way around. And this is the story of the Panathenaic Festival. And some of the most famous sculptures from ancient Greece, like this, these equestrian riders here, come from this frieze, come from the Panathenaic Festival. Okay, so the festival itself takes place every four years in Athens. There are actually two different ones. The greater one uh, takes place every four years in Athens in honor of Athena. Uh, and it includes all sorts of things. We know that it lasts like eight days long and it's not just a religious thing. It's in addition to like kind of being a religious thing, there's like music and sports. Uh, there's this giant procession, a lot of this stuff. An added center, the goal of this procession um, and festival is to bring a new garment to the goddess. And so what you're looking at here is the painted Parthenon, right? So this would have all been painted, all this decoration in antiquity. And then you're getting this procession with a new garment known as a peplos, right? That's the Greek name for this type of garment. It's brought in on the mast of a ship because it's so, so big, and it's taken to be placed upon the cult statue. Now, the, the, the kind of festival itself, in addition to this procession, has all sorts of competitions. And so it's got a, athletic competitions, right? Like uh, equestrian horse events, uh, boat races, army maneuvers. Um, and uh, what you end up getting when you win one of these things is right here. So it's kind of amazing that we still have like the prizes from uh, these, these competitions. In addition, there were musical competitions, poetry recitations, all these things uh, would have been competitions between Athenians in honor of Athena. You can see a, a kind of rough um, kind of order of events. That's one modern creation, a recreation of how things might have happened. Um, and then you can go through and actually look at kind of how this procession would have occurred by looking at the sculptures on the Parthenon. So it begins with the horsemen. You can see charioteers leaping on and off of the chariots. From there, you get people moving by foot, right? So you can see people bringing uh, sacrifices to be sacrificed. And then at the core, you see the peplos, the garment itself. Uh, and at its core, what you'll be looking at is again, the garment being prepared and then the garment itself being presented to the goddess amongst all the different Olympian gods. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look here at how it winds through the city. We'll wrap up with this uh, for today. Um, on Friday, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. TAs, um, we can talk uh, via email or something about exactly how we want to, to finish this up and then move on to Friday's reading as well. Uh, get those um, research proposals done. Good work today. I will see everybody on Friday. Have a great couple days, people, all right?